glad you're back. And now we're going to be looking at the practical aspects of the sanctuary. What I did in the last presentation was give a framework that we have an understanding of the importance to it, it is to, as a people. When an Adventist says the sanctuary is not important, they are, they're telling me several things. Number one, they don't know anything about sanctuary. Number two, they know nothing about the history of this church. And, and because when you begin to understand it, you begin to realize it's not only important, it's our identity. It's who we are. And, uh, and then you'll, you'll have a message with them. So why don't we begin with a word of prayer. And once again, uh, ask the presence of the Lord to be with us. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you humbly, thanking you so much for what you have revealed to us already, and Lord, in eager anticipation to what you're about to teach us. And so, Father, I, I pray that you'll give me the words and again refresh and stimulate my mind. Father, you have a room full of people here, and each one of these people have come for a different reason. Each one, Father, has a need in their life that I could not possibly meet, but you can. And so again, we're inviting your presence, humbly recognizing that apart from you, we will learn nothing, and we are nothing. So please, God, be our teacher. Thank you for that, Father, so much. Give us the gift of discernment. I pray, Lord, especially you give me grace, that you'll touch my tongue, that will nothing will leave my mouth, that Father is not filtered through you. Thank you for this. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Did somebody? Okay. Come on. As I shared with you, I uh, I enjoy studying the sanctuary because it explains God's plan of salvation and how He intends uh, to save us. The sanctuary was a mechanism of instruction. It's very easy, interesting that in, uh, in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, and God declared to, um, to Adam and Eve the plan. Let's take a look at it real quick. Let's take a look at the plan of salvation fleshed out really, really, really fast in Genesis chapter 3. And we have to understand when we read this, we're going to kind of go, uh, I don't get it. But let's take a look at it. Genesis chapter 3. And the plan is explained um, in uh, verse 14 and verse 15. Verse 14 and 15 says this. So the Lord said to who? Serpent. The serpent. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than all every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Here it is. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Who's the woman? The church. And between your seed and her seed. And he, if you got a King James, New King James, that he is what? It's capital. It's Christ. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. his heel. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. And so in that, Jesus, God explains the plan of salvation. Adam and Eve had a superior intellect. And so with that, they understood that one day God would come and die to save us. They were able to discern that from those few words. Now, when the children of Israel went into uh, Canaan, or I should say to Egypt, they stayed there for hundreds of years, and in the process, lost a lot of their identity. Uh, they, they picked up a lot of, uh, of pagan stuff, and they lost a lot of the message. And I'm going through this very quickly. So God brought them out, took them to Sinai, gave them the sanctuary services to reconnect them with the plan. And so he fleshed it out for them and made it easier for them to understand. By the way, when, when Jesus died on the cross, that was the death knell for Satan, right? All right? Okay. What was the name of the place he was crucified? Golgotha. What does that mean? Do you remember the curse? The blow would come to Lucifer where? Okay. No filler in scripture. Folly and care. And all the full So what we're going to do today 
is we're going to look at three aspects of the sanctuary. Number one, what we're going to do right now, we're going to look at at what the Jew was supposed to understand. Do you have a, a note to write on, or do you have a, the study sheets? Nope. Thank you, my brother. Um, what was the Jew to understand? We're going to look at it from the role of the priest, what the priest was supposed to do. I, I'm out. We'll have to get more copies. I'll get more copies. What's in the copies? Oh, you can share? Uh, you know, probably make another 10, would be my guess. Oh, bless your heart. You know what? Is everybody covered? Let's do it after the session. Okay. So you don't miss out. But, um, <clears throat> so we're going to look at it from the standpoint of the role of the priest, his work. Then what we're going to do is we're going to look at it as to how it points to Jesus. Because the sanctuary tells us what Jesus has done, what Jesus is doing, and what Jesus is about to do. The sanctuary says it all. Now, the last thing we'll do is we're going to look at it as how it relates to prayer. And I shared with you how the sanctuary prompts us to pray. And, uh, and I like it, and I share with you why, because I have uh, the attention span of a gnat with ADD. <laughs> and, uh, and it helps me. My mind wanders, and then it brings me back again to where I was supposed to be. And, uh, and we keep going. But the sanctuary actually tells me what I should be praying for. So with that... Um, we're going to look at those three perspectives. Earthly priest, Christ in his ministry of heaven, and then what it quotes for me, uh, what it directs me to pray. Now normally I have a PowerPoint. And I do have a PowerPoint. But uh, I, I didn't want to take any more time to getting it set up right now. And you have my handouts anyway, so it's not a big deal. But it is very visual, and you can see here the different furnishings. We're going to first be going to the brazen altar. We're going to go to the labor. By the way, this is the, the entrance. Then this is the sanctuary, the tabernacle. And we open it up. This is what it looks like inside. You have the menorah. You have the table of showbread. You have the golden altar. And then behind that, you have the Ark of the Covenant. And inside, you have the Ten Commandments, uh, Aaron's rod, and the, uh, the manna. So as I reference these things, you can kind of look over here and get an idea then of what I'm talking about. The first thing I want you to see, and this is amazing does the devil ever scare you? Does he ever bring fear into your life and worry? Do you want to bring a little to him? <laughs> Take a look at this quote in Great Controversy 519. Oh wait, we're going to get to that quote later. Let's go to this one first. Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures might be overcome by his attack. Well, is it might be? You got to keep an eye on the pastor. <laughs> Satan well knows that all, how many? All. Whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures, what's the next two words? Will be overcome by his attacks. It's not might be. It's no maybe. If we're not in the word and we're not on our knees, we're, we're toast. I mean, it's that simple. Can, can I just stop? This should be on the second. When the devil took on Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were fresh from the Creator's hand. Their brain was funk, was firing on all eight cylinders. One hundred percent superior intellect compared to what we are now. We we are mentally retarded <laughs> compared to what Adam and Eve were. We, can you imagine? Even with our intellect, if we lived nine hundred years, you know how much stuff we would know. Do you know what I'm saying? They had superior intellect. Their nature was unfallen. We have a fallen nature. They had an unfallen nature. And yet Satan wasn't Satan was still an amateur. He still got he was starting in this but now he has six thousand years experience. He was an amateur. In his first encounter with Adam and Eve, as an amateur, with their superior intellect and unfallen nature, he dropped them. He defeated them. What do you think is gonna to happen to you and me? How much of a chance do we have? If we're not in prayer and in the word, there isn't a chance in the world we'll be saved. It's that simple. I mean, if devotional life is as optional as breathing. Mm -hmm. You with me? Yes. 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 <clears throat> Satan well knows that. And so when we look at the sanctuary, the sanctuary actually is a model for when we're to have worship. The timing is found in the scriptures. The first thing is the priest. There was a service called the daily, and it took place every, every day. 
In the morning, the priest would be standing on the wall, and when the sun broke the horizon, he would blow the shofar. And, and it would echo throughout Israel. And all the Israelites would turn to the sanctuary at that time and would pray. It was a call to worship. All right? It was known as the daily. An offering was made during that time, an offering of dedication, of dedicating the people for that day, which is part of the worship service of that day, which is a reminder that every day we dedicate our lives to Christ. But we'll touch on that. And, and then that, that inaugurated the service for the day, and then people brought their offerings, their sin offerings, their thank offerings for the day. And the priest went through the entire experience of making sure, uh, well, do I get into that right now? Well, he started his, his services, which began at the brazen altar, the labor where he washed his hands and feet before he came into uh, the, the tabernacle, the, 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 temp, the, the bread of presence that was placed there every Sabbath, the menorah, which he made sure the oil was always placed in there because God gave instruction that the light was never to go out. And then he put incense uh, on the, the golden altar. And he did that work every day, and that's why he was called the daily. There's another service called the yearly, that which was done once a year. Not complicated, is it? Oh, I love that about God. He makes things very simple. I like that, because that's how I am. I need things simple. Now, how does this point me to Jesus? In Isaiah 40, verses 4 and 5, we read Jesus' habit. It says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me how? By morning. He awakens my ear to hear as to learn. Jesus started his day in worship. Long before people woke up, Jesus found his way to those hills and spent time with his Father in earnest prayer. And so as I start my worship time, I am reminded that my worship time should begin in the morning. You know, I heard a man once say, when do, when our battles, uh, when do we put on our armor? Before the battle or after the battle? <laughs> if you start your day, you're going into the war, friend. There is a battle waiting for you. And that's the time we go before the Lord in prayer. And we ask to be with us. If we have worship, and, and worship at the end of the time, at the end of the day too, I don't know about that. But don't neglect the morning. If you neglect the morning and you only have evening, you're going to end up with the loser's prayer. Lord, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. But in the morning when we go to the Lord, that's where we find our strength for the day. Amen? Amen. So we start our day uh, with the Lord in prayer. But not only is the sanctuary a model for when to worship, it is a model, I mean for prayer, when to pray, but it's a model for how to pray. The first thing we do, uh, the, the, we do is that we enter in through the outer gate there. It's nice and pretty in my drawing down there. When the repentant sinner came to the priest to, to give a sacrifice, he was met there by the priest. The priest would meet him at the entryway. That gate was important to the sinner who wanted forgiveness. That gate made, meant something to him. Now, how does that gate point to Jesus? In John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Does that not amaze you? Mm -hmm. Jesus was pointing to the sanctuary, friends. You keep reading his play on the word door, you will be amazed. Mm -hmm. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Mm -hmm. By the way, Jesus says that anyone who comes in any other way is a thief and a robber. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. The only way is through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, coming to him. And when we come to the gate, David tells us what our attitude should be as we walk into the gate. Mm -hmm. Psalms 100, 1 through 5. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are the sheep, we are the people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with what? And into his courts with what? Praise. Be thankful to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all what? Generation. 
So this tells me, the sanctuary tells me that when I go before the Lord to have worship, I begin my worship by praying, by giving thanks and praises to Him. Amen. By the way, there's a difference between a uh, thanks and a praise. We thank God for what He has done. We praise God for who He is. Mm -hmm. There is a difference. I praise Him for His attributes. I say, Lord, I am so thankful you are merciful to a sinner. Thank you for your great patience and the kindness that you have demonstrated towards me, someone who is so undeserving. And, and so I can praise him and thank him. And you know, some people, if you want, sometimes I sing. I'll have my hymn book, and at this time I'll sing songs to him during this time. But it's a time of, of thanking. It is a time of praising uh, the Lord. And you know, it's very interesting that when we do that, what we're doing is we're calibrating our thinking. Because really, many times when we pray, we have our list of everything we want God to fix. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. God doesn't have a problem with that. But there is an order to things. God loves to help us and to work in our lives. But as we come before the Lord in prayer, if somebody can share with her, so that we're good. Okay. Make sure that she has somebody to look up. We want you to make sure you can look up somebody's paper next to you. But... Um, but what happens is oftentimes what happens is that we focus on our problems and by doing it, we magnify them. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you want something to read, read a chapter called Mind Cure in Ministry of Healing. Mind Cure in Ministry of Healing. Uh, that's huge, that's huge. And we magnify, but when we start to praise God, then God gets bigger and our problems get smaller. But we focus on the problems, then our problems get bigger and God gets smaller. Does that make sense? So when we come before the Lord praising and thanking and we're calibrating our thinking to who it is we're approaching. It's so important. Now, I want to share that quote. <laughs> Has the devil ever made you scared? You want to make him scared? Yes. Prophets and Kings 202. Oh, I did it again. I'm jumping the gun. I'll get to that quote. <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't wait to show this to you. But what is this? I'm, I'm, really, I'm, really, I'm really getting you all stoked for that quote. <laughs> if more praising of God were engaged in now, hope and courage and faith would steadily increase. You want, do you need your faith and courage and hope increased in your life? Do you know why it isn't? Because we're focused on the problem mm. and not on the solution. You know, Ellen White makes this comment that when we praise God, angels of light draw near. You know, the angels love that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We begin praising God and thanking Him. They can't resist that. They come in and they start joining us. But when we murmur and complain, who draws near? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> praising God. Praising God and thanking God is how we begin our worship. The next thing, when we enter into the court, the first thing we encounter is the brazen altar. The brazen altar is the area where sin and the sinner were to be separated. Now, you have to understand, and we can't truly appreciate this, you know, many of you will, will see pictures of the sanctuary in the wilderness, and we'll see the tents right up against the sanctuary. No. No, if you remember that when they crossed the Jordan, God gave specific instructions. They would be 2,000 cubits from the sanctuary. When the sanctuary, and it's very interesting, God is a God of order. God had all of the tribes set up in a very orderly fashion around the sanctuary. In fact, when Balaam came to curse them, and he stood and he looked, he went, the order was breathtaking. He knew that God's hand was upon his people. But in the dead center was a sanctuary, and separated from the closest tent by about 2,000 cubits, or three-fourths of a mile, there was this plaza. So when the sinner came to repent for the sin, he remembered a sin that was in his life. He remembered, oh, I did that thing. He grabbed the lamb, and he went walking through the, the tens of thousands until he came to that plaza. And there was nothing now between him and that tabernacle. It took courage, mm -hmm. and he went walking. And don't you know that tongues were wagging? Yeah. I wonder what he but there was a few, there's been peer pressure in every generation. Mm -hmm. But we've got to go through that. Either we're going to impress people or we're going to impress God. Mm -hmm. right. We're worried about what people think or we're worried about what God thinks. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. Either people are big or God is big. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. And so he, they would go forward. When he got to the edge and he got to the entrance, the priest would meet him. And the priest would invite him in. 
And the priest, man, he was such a welcome. Once he came in, the, the curtain closed behind him. That curtain, the white curtain, stood about seven and a half feet. So people outside couldn't tell what was going on. They were shut in. And there the priest would explain to him the role that he was about to play. And then the, the, the repentant sinner would come and he would confess his sin upon the lamb, not to the priest. Hmm. Yeah, wow. He would confess it silently to the lamb. And what was happening is that symbolically a transfer was taking place. Mm -hmm. The sin that was now on him is being transferred onto the lamb. Mm -hmm. Now it's the lamb's sin. And then, with his own hand, he had to do the awful work of taking the life of the little innocent man. And then, wow. as the blood was oozing out, the life was oozing out, the priest would come and he would catch it. And that blood now became the symbol that, of the carrying agent of that sin. So the sin went from me to the lamb to that blood. Then the priest would walk into the holy place and he would sprinkle that blood to the sanctuary. This is extremely important. Don't miss this. Because God was teaching Israel how he was going to deal with the sin problem. He has to destroy sin, but he's got to find a way to do it without destroying the sin. And he found a way by transferring the sin onto his own son. His son becomes the agent. And now that blood is transferred here, signifying what? that that sin that was mine, that went to the land, that went to the blood, is now in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And that would that happened day after day, with Israel after Israel, all year long. And what was happening is all those sins were collected, symbolically. At the end of the year, there was a service called the Day of Atonement, and it was on that day that all that record of sin was removed. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk more about that as we go on. So don't lose track of that. But that's basically how the sin then is transferred. Now, how does that, that brazen altar point me to Jesus? In John 1.29, John the Baptist, inspired by the Holy Spirit, seeing Jesus there on the side of the Jordan River, pointed to him and said, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin. That lamb pointed to the one who was going to come to take away sin. By the way, Paul tells us that all those animals that died never removed a single sin. But it all pointed to those sacrifices that the Son of God would take away our sin. Do you realize what's happening? Is that the Jew had to live by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter is all Old Testament people. He had to live by faith. He looked forward to the death of Christ. We live by faith by looking back to the death of Christ. Are you with me? All by faith. So for me, during my prayer time, as I enter in, I, I finish thanking and praising God, when I get to the brazen altar, I then think in my mind, I ask God, if there's any sin that stands between my soul and my Savior, is there anything that I have done wrong? I have my daughter here in the back. And uh, you know, I'm going to be, by the way, when I talk, I, I, I'm just transparent. Uh, I want to bid you, don't follow me, follow Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I am in the same boat you are. I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and I'm in need of transformation. Are you with me? I'm going to be honest. Yeah. And, and you know, I, my background is a rough background, okay? I share just a little bit with some of you. And I, I, I have a lot of stuff that needs to be transformed. And by the way, if the people I grew up with saw me here standing before you as a pastor, uh, they would be speechless. The, the tribute to the power of God. Mm -hmm. But if a day comes that I'm impatient with my daughter or with my wife, is that pleasing to God? And as I'm having worship after praising my father and I talk to him, the Lord will bring to my mind you, my son, will have patience with Sarah yesterday. You need to take care of it. And that's what God expects me to do. So I got to make sure that there's nothing. Remember how Pastor Kim said nothing remaining in the books? This is the time when I ask God to reveal to me. You know, is there anything? And I check the last 24 hours of my life. I go through the day. Is there anything, Lord? Have I done anything to misrepresent you? And if the Lord reveals something to me, I ask him to forgive me. By the way, do I deserve it? 
do you? I hear people all the time say, I don't deserve it. I say, then get over it. We all know that. <laughs> <laughs> Grace can only be given to a guilty person. Understand that. Grace is never extended to an innocent person. Salvation is not for good people. It's only for bad people. Good people don't need a Savior. Right, are you with me? Yes. And so the bigger sinner you know yourself to be, you're going to come to an understanding how big Savior he is. Mm -hmm. And so at that, I'm reminded, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive. To forgive me my sins and to cleanse me of what? Oh, how much? Oh. And so I go to him and I ask God for forgiveness. So that is, uh, it is at this time that I ask God to forgive me. Now, at the next, uh, next we go to the labor. In the labor, uh, this is where the priest would wash his hands and feet before ministering anywhere. It was a water experience for dedication. Are you with me? That water experience was a commitment. It was a water dedication. They washed their hands, washed their feet before they ministered. And that's what the priest did. But how does this point me to Jesus? With Jesus, did Jesus have a water experience in his life? In Luke 3, 21 and 23, it says, And it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now watch this, don't miss this. Now Jesus began himself, began his... Ministry. Did you catch it? The water experience before ministry. At about the age of what? Right. By the way, that's how old God said the priest had to be before he began ministering in the sanctuary. Do you think that's a coincidence? Not at all. By the way, the year did change, but I was later when Saul wiped out all the priests and then David dropped the age to 20. But that's the reason why, because there were no other priests. <laughs> and, uh, but initially it was 30. And so you see a fulfillment in the tabernacle that points that Jesus is the Messiah. But, uh, but anyway, it's a little water experience. So to me, when I get to this part, I rededicate my life to Christ. Dear friends, we do not rather dedicate our lives to Jesus Christ one time. Every day, we recommit our life to Jesus. Every day, I ask the Lord, Lord, please, as I give, begin my prayer, I say different things. I can say a, a, a version of something Ellen White said, Lord, take my heart. And I can't get it. Keep it pure. I can't keep it for you. Take myself, my own Christ-like self, and mold me in the atmosphere of heaven where the rich current of your love will flow through me. I ask God to, fu to fulfill Romans 5.5, 5, that his love will be poured into my heart. I ask God to take me and to glorify his name. Give me the mind of Christ. Are you with me? I spend time there with Jesus, recommitting my life to him and asking him to take my life. Amen? Mm -hmm. I ask him to. After I have done that, I have asked him to do that. Um, I then go into the holy place, into the, the lampstand. Now the lampstand was the only light, the only light source in the holy place. And uh, the priest that I mentioned was to make sure that that light never went out. How does that point to Jesus? And to Jesus, in John, uh, not John, but in John, yeah, John 8, 12, it says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Have the light of life. And so it, it reminds me, by the way, what was Christ's source of power? Do you remember what his source of power was? Do you remember when he went into the River Jordan, he was baptized, what came upon him? The Holy Spirit. What, what, is the, what symbol do we find in the sanctuary for the Holy Spirit? Actually, there's a number. But specifically at the menorah. The oil. The oil. And we find that in Zechariah, Chapter 4, 6, Zechariah 4, 6, is we find there that the symbol, that the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so how, what does that point to me? It is a reminder to me that I must be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. That just as Jesus was the light of the world, I am asked to be a light of the world as well in my sphere of influence. And so I ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Ellen White has this to say, very interesting. Volume 6, Testimonies, page 117. We need and must have fresh supplies. How often? Every day. All heaven is? 
No, no, no. You all didn't get that. Mm -hmm. Do you realize that heaven is anxious? Mm -hmm. They're waiting. They're waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and a blessing to others. Did you just see the angels? They're just like... <laughs> <laughs> They're waiting. Are you with me? We need to be asking. And so as I begin each day, I ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to spend a long time on this, although I do have a little bit more time than I thought about. We talk a lot about the latter rain. There is a problem we've got to understand. That if the early rain has not had its work upon my life, the latter rain will do no good. Do you understand that? Everybody's praying for the latter rain, and I'm listening, and I hear nobody praying for the early. The early rain began at Pentecost. We are living under the dispensation of the early rain. It's falling. Early rain is where character is developed that prepares the person for the latter. Do you understand? The latter rain brings it to maturity and prepares it for the last message and to seal them to the time of trouble. But the early rain is the power to transform the life. That's not what the latter rain's for. Are you, are you with me? And so I ask God, you see how the century prompts me on what it is, and I pray and I ask the Lord, Lord, prepare my heart. If there's anything in my life that is, that is blocking the flow, I pray, Lord, you reveal that to me. But Lord, fill me. Fill me. I want the mind of Christ. Fill my life, dear Lord, with your presence and prepare me to receive the latter rain. When I come here before I speak, I'm asking God to hide me behind the, Christ, the, the cross that Christ would be seen and heard. I'm just an instrument. You know, I may, I may be lost tomorrow. You're not here to hear me. I, you got to hear Jesus. Are you with me? It's not about the instrument. It's about the Savior. And so I'm asking the Lord to fill me. Uh, you know, when I was in uh, the academy, uh, you know, we talk a lot about revival. And my kids have a great imagination. But... Uh, they said, you know, revival, you realize that there has to be reformation. Revival, all revival is, it's a wake-up call. <laughs> I'm doing something wrong. Reformation is, do something about it. <laughs> Are you with me? Just, if I get revival, I know something's wrong, and I do nothing about it, then I will actually sink lower than before the revival. Mm -hmm. And for God to, re to wake me up now, he has to use drastic measures. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And then I have another revival. And if I don't do anything about it, you see the process. Mm -hmm. And so there has to be reformation. But, but this young person said, revival, reformation, and continuation. Keep going. It's a continual growth process. And it's done with the Holy Spirit. So I ask the Holy Spirit into my life to prepare me. Now the next thing I do is I go to the table of showbread. Now the table of showbread, we had these 12 loaves of bread. Each loaf represented one of the tribes of Israel. And in the loaf, it was a reminder to Israel that God provided all their needs. Once a week, every Sabbath, a new loaf was placed. And miraculously, it was kept throughout the week. It didn't spoil. And you who bake bread, you know that if it's fresh bread, it'll go, it'll go pretty fast. But God performed a miracle. And even after that, it was still sustained for the priesthood to eat it. It was still edible. And so it was a reminder to Israel that God provided all of their needs, physically and spiritually. How does this point to Jesus, though? How does, how does that table remind me of Jesus? In John 6, verse 48, we find these words. Jesus said, I am bread of life. It is Jesus who supplies us with everything bread, mm -hmm. both physically and spiritually. Jesus is the one who supplies us. And so during my worship time, I will go before the Lord at this time, and I will ask Jesus to give me strength to face today's temptations and trials. I have no idea what's awaiting me, but I know he does. And so I ask him. And what I'll do, I'm, I'm a little old-fashioned here. I, have a, I use a day planner. And there's a long reason why I use a day planner. When I found out that those little gizmos, if you drop them, if they get wet, you lose all the information, I said, forget. <laughs> and so I use my day planner. I can drop it, it gets wet, it's still there. And, uh, and what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll kneel and I'll open up my day planner and I'll take it before Jesus. And I will go through every appointment, every class I have to teach, every event, every challenge. And you know, we were talking earlier about listening for God. When I read my Bible, I hear Jesus talk to me. Mm -hmm. And during this time of my worship, as I am presenting problems, as I'm talking to God, I will suddenly start getting ideas. Mm -hmm. And 
and you better have a pencil and paper ready because God doesn't sit there and remind laziness. And you say, but I forgot that thing, what was it again? <laughs> <laughs> you have to have your pencil and paper ready because the Lord is going to start bringing you. There are times to say, Lord, my schedule is so crazy. I've got to do this, 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 and this, and there's no way I can do it. And the Lord will bring to my mind, you know, Mary can handle that and that for you. Yeah. Oh, that's right. She could handle that. And I have to write those things down. But as I'm going through my game planner, God is giving me ideas. I'm laying my plan. And I'm also giving him permission to override my plans. Because there'll be times, by the way, you know something the world is dying to hear. They're dying. They're literally dying. They're dying. When I think about the tsunami that hit a 20, over 200,000 people, I think of Haiti, over 200,000 people, it breaks my heart. The world is dying to know what you and I have. So God will interrupt your schedule. And, he will bring, and it's not going to come at a time that's convenient. We've got to be aware. We've got to trust our schedule to God. And so as I present my schedule, I also ask him if there's someone he needs me to talk to. He has the freedom to move on. And i got to trust him to take care of my business. Are you with me? Because I'm going about my father's business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. But that's what I do during this time on my prayer line. The next thing, then, uh, is, uh, it is the golden altar, which stood before the ark that separated the curtain. Now, this to me was kind of amazing because I shared with you that when the blood was sprinkled, he would also sprinkle on the four corners, and then during the morning evening sacrifice, when the dedication lamb was given, there was incense. But on the other side of that curtain was God. I wonder what went through the mind of the priest. What went through the mind? As you were walking in, You know, I often wonder at night, like uh, the children of Israel, as the camp was asleep, everything was still, that perfect order around the sanctuary. Above the sanctuary was a cloud. It was much grander than that. And it grew, and it was a fiery cloud at night. You know, in the desert, at night it get cold, and the light says it really gave really warm. It was like a night light. It was a soft light at night, and it really gave would you just see yourself sitting outside the tent and just looking? That was him. How amazing would that be? And so when the priest came, it was this part of the service that draw him the closest to God. What does that tell us about prayer? Because really that's what it's about. Because it was incense. It's very interesting because King David, King David says to us in Psalms 141 verse 2, let my prayer be set before you as incense. The incense was a symbol of God's righteousness connected to your request to make it presentable to the Father. That's what it was. So it was this right here that brought us closer to the Lord. How does it point us to Jesus? In 1 Timothy 2.5 it says, For there is one God, and, and, and as a Catholic, this was important to me. Watch this. Only those who are Catholics can appreciate this text. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one It's the only one. I don't have to go to anyone else. I don't have to go through my pastor. I don't have to go through a priest. I don't have to go through the elder. I don't have to go through anyone. I can go directly to him. Directly to Jesus. And he's waiting for me. But it was prayer that brought the priest closest. That service. And it's prayer that brings us incredibly close. God bends down and God hears. Hebrews 7.25. How anxious is he to hear? Oh, wait. Yeah. Therefore, he is also able to save, I love this, to the what? Amen. To the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make what? Intercession. I love that. You know, it would have been enough just for him to say, therefore, he is also able to save those who come to God through him. It would have been enough to say that. But no, to the uttermost. I like that. He wants to make sure it's covered. God knows how to take care of us, and prayer is a critical component to a transforming walk with Jesus. Very important, and he always lives to make intercession. It's his joy. But what does this tell me about prayer? This tells me that I'm to mediate for others. You know, there are people, we have loved ones that aren't serving the Lord, and they're not praying. Let me, let me share something with you. Let me, let me get into this real quick. 
<clears throat> you know, those of you who have any experience in the military, have you heard of the, ex the expression, rules of engagement? You ever heard that expression, rules of engagement? What it is, they're actually rules of war, really. Yeah, there are. There are rules of war. I, didn't think, I thought everything counted. No? Well, most of them. But there are actually rules of war. For example, during World War I, uh, those guys threw everything they can get their hands on at each other. I mean, if it killed somebody, they threw it at the other side. And they gassed each other. They used chemical warfare during World War I. I don't know if you're yeah. aware of that. It's yeah, a horrible. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people coughed. They coughed to death. Mm. You know, that's, they, the people were in trenches, so they thought, let's get them in the trenches. So they threw gas, and the gas went to the lowest points. And they killed tens of thousands of one another. After the war was over, they all got together and said, you know, the next time we have war, uh, let's not do the gas thing. <laughs> so, this is in uh, Verdun. And so, when you get to World War II, does, is anybody using gas? No. Are, they, are the armies throwing gas at each no, other in World War II? They weren't using gas on each other. Okay, but they all had it. And everybody was waiting. The, the first nation that used it was going to get it from everybody else. <laughs> so, nobody used gas. So that, the reason being, because there's rules of engagement. Now, since Vietnam, uh, the United States used a, used a weapon called napalm. Mm -hmm. And after Vietnam, the world got together and said, you know what, we're not using that anymore. Agent we're not using Agent Orange. So th there are rules. And you don't, so it, now the next war, no napalm. But now we find other horrible things to do to each other. But my point is this, there's rules of engagement. In the spiritual war between Christ and Satan, there are rules of engagement. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes. Christ cannot force himself into your life, and Satan can either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can only come by invitation. <laughs> so when your brother, who isn't serving Christ, is going to go out and drink that night, and Satan has got a, a, a truck waiting for him at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the crossing, you can go to your knees and say, Lord, I'm asking you to plead while we're still working during time. Please protect him. And so when God comes in, Satan says, hey, he didn't ask for help. Buzz off. God can say, his brother Oh. Are you with me? These are rules of engagement. Rules of engagement. Do you remember the mediation that Abraham was making? Wow. These are rules of engagement. So we can pray and, and God can act. God can act. God wants us to pray. We don't pray enough. Look at this. Now here's now I think I'm in the right place. I am. Watch this quote. Volume 1 Testimony 346. At the sound of fervent prayer. Satan's whole host tremble. Amen. What is it the devil knows that we know? Here's this weak elderly lady who says, I can do nothing for the Lord anymore. And when she goes to her knees and that grandma begins to pray, what she's doing is she is unleashing heaven's strategic air command. Amen. Now heaven can get all Are you with me? Yeah. Prayer is important. And so during this time, I pray for my family. I pray for... Uh, daughter's going to hear this. I know she's ever heard me say this. But I am praying for the spouses of my children. Since they were little. <laughs> Since they were little. I pray for their parents. I say, Lord, in this corrupt world, give those parents some courage and some starch to stand up for what's right. Help them to stand up against the, 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 the tsunami of corruption that is coming in. Give them some courage. Help them to be willing to stand. Dear Lord, I pray for those children, Lord, keep them pure. Keep them pure, Father. Keep them focused just on me as I'm praying for my own. And I pray for my students. I pray for the staff at the school. I pray for the people at church. Are you with me? Let me share something with you. During World War II, the United States came up with a formula that was successful in their, in their war in, in, in Europe. What they would do, everybody knew that whoever controlled the air controlled the ground. If you can control the air, you control the ground. So everybody was trying to produce the best fighters to control the air. And the United States came up with one that was outstanding, the P-51 Mustang. But what happened was this. First they'd bring in their air force. Then they'd bring in their tanks, their armor. Then they'd bring in the artillery. And then they'd bring in the troops. That was, if you study, that's how the United States did it. But there's a spiritual counterpoint. You see, the armor today are going to be our radio programs. The artillery today is going to be our literature. And then the, the troops are our lay people, okay? Our evangelists, our, our people who are sharing. Are you with me? But to have success, you've got to take control of the air. Mm -hmm. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. And his superiority has to be challenged. And as we pray, his power is challenged. 
understood. Amen. And he has defeated foe. But if we work without praying, we're going to be defeated. Mm -hmm. We have to take control of the air and prayer. Now look at this next one. Volume 2, Selected Messages, uh, page 377. Ministering angels are waiting about the throne. To what? It instantly obey the mandate of Jesus Christ in answer to every prayer offered in earnest living faith. Now that did not pack you. Okay. <laughs> I want you to picture this. Picture this. Imagination. Close your eyes. If you want, I think it'll be helpful if you do. I want you to picture that throne of grace. I want you to see that beautiful rainbow, the radiant light that is emanating from that throne. And here on planet Earth, this darkened world, a young lady kneels by her bed. She prays. And Jesus leans on, on, his, on his, his, his hand on his face, his elbow on his knee, and he's listening. And all around that throne are angels that are watching what's happening. And the muscles are twitching as they're waiting for Jesus to give the command. Jesus turns to one of the angels and says, and points. And the angel goes. And the light says, those angels travel the speed of thought. But how often do those angels wait in vain? Mm. They see what's happening and they look at each other. Oh, he's ready to pray. Wow. Why is nobody praying? We're here. We're here. We're ready. Pray. Somebody pray. Mm. To instantly obey the mandate of Christ to answer every prayer. Oh. Mm. Let's not keep them waiting. So there I pray, intercessory prayer for others. Then I go into the most holy place. And here, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter. Now remember, I shared with you that the sins were being transferred day by day, 365 days throughout the whole year. And all that record of sin had polluted the sanctuary. And so once a year, there was a service that cleansed out all of that and placed it on a goat that they called Isaiah. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But all of it was transferred and placed on uh, that goat. So there was this, this, uh, this transfer. Now, while that was taking place, it, everybody in Israel was focused on the sanctuary. They were not working. Nobody was working. That whole day, everybody was paying attention to what was going on. And they, and, and they were asking themselves, is there any sin? That, is, that I did not ask for forgiveness for. Because they knew that once he came out, those sins were done away with, but once he came out, that was it. If there was any sin remaining, it remained on, on an individual. And they knew that. It was a solemn day. And the Jew, you go right now to the Jewish encyclopedias, and it said they understood it to be a day of judgment. They understood it to be a judgment day. Very interesting. And so they would search their hearts. And while that was going on, if they confessed their sin, the priest in there, in the service, mediated for that sin. Okay? And it was dealt with. But they were all focused, very much intent, on that day. But how does that remind us of Jesus? In Daniel 7.13, it describes to us the ending of the 2300-day period. It, is, it show, shows us that it was on that day, October 22, that Jesus transferred from the holy to the most holy place to begin the investigative judgment. The day of atonement, the day that Jesus is away with all of our sins that were transferred onto him, and he's about ready to place them on his face, on Lucifer. By the way, you do realize Jesus died to pay for your penalty. The wages of sin is, is death. Jesus died for that. But you understand that there is justice. There is a punishment that has to be given for all of those sins. Either you pay for it, or the prince of darkness. And as you transfer all the sins onto Jesus, when Jesus cleanses and gets that record of sin, they are placed on Azazel, on Satan. And he is recognized as the instigator of those sins. And the punishment that would have been yours now goes on him. Now, do you think he wants to be punished for your sin? Mm -hmm. He wants you to be. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to be punished for your sin. You know, when Satan tempts you and says, you'll have a good time. Mm -hmm. You have more fun with me than you will with God. In the back of his mind, he's thinking, yeah, I want you to pay me, not me. He's not interested in you having a good time. He's a psychopathic serial killer. And 
the first chance he gets to snuff us out, he wins. Mm. That's what he's about. Wow. That's what he's about. Wow. That's what he's about. But God made a way through his son. And so oh, Daniel 7 13 tells us, and I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. By the way, if we were standing on Ascension Rock on October 22, 1844, outside of William Miller's farm, and had read this, we would have been reading what was transpiring in heaven at that very moment. It's amazing. And so today, it's a reminder to me and it, it, that, that this keeps, as I'm doing the sanctuary prayer, it's keeping present truth before me. And during this time, I ask God to search me in my life. You know, because there's stuff going on in our lives that we, can, we sit in ignorance. Amen? Mm -hmm. We're not even aware of. And in Psalms 19.12, we read, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. I'm going to unpack this as we go on. I'm not going to spend too much time on this right now. Jeremiah 17.19.10 says, The heart is what? Deceitful. deceitful. Oh, By the way, wouldn't it have been enough to say the heart is deceitful? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's saying there's nothing to compare. You can't compare anything to this. The heart is deceitful of all things. And it's not just wicked. How wicked is it? Desperately. It's desperately. Who can know it? Now the answer. I know it. Search the heart. I testify. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doing. Psalm 139, 23, 24. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me, know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. All right. I'm not going to unpack this right now. Oh, your turn. Okay. <laughs> During this time, I, uh, I really, I have prayed for everything and everyone else. And this is a time, it's a very special time that I can be with God. And I ask God, and I tell him, you know, Lord, I keep seeing some of these struggles continue over and over in my life. What's the source? Why am I continually struggling? You know, God wants us to reach, to deal with sin at its root level. Yes. Mm -hmm. What in the world is taking place here? Will you reveal it to me, Father? What's going on? You know, Daniel 2 reminded that God is the revealer of secrets. secrets. This seems a secret to me, but not to you. And so I'm asking, will you reveal this to me? What is going on? And, and so this is a very intimate time for me, and it is also a time that I, I share my dreams with God, you know, my hopes with God, my fears with God. I lay it all out. This is my personal communion time with my Heavenly Father. It's just Him and me. It's just my stuff together. And so this is the most intimate time of, of my devotional. And so that is the sanctuary prayer. And what it does for me is it keeps me focused. It helps you to understand what I should be praying for. It, are, it, it just lays it out for me. And then if my mind should wander, I can bring it back immediately. I knew where I was last, and I can continue with my devotional time mm -hmm. and life with God. And uh, it is a continual reminder to me of present truth of what God has done, what God is doing, and what God is about to do. And that's the sanctuary prayer. And by the way, as I share this, I want to say, it's not the only way to pray. And it may not even be the best way, but it works for me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I pray that way. So at this time, I'll go ahead and close this out. We'll get ready for our last session. Our last session is entitled, The Daily Today. And we already know what the daily is, don't we? It was that daily activity that took place day after day in Israel. But how does that apply to us today? We'll look at that. And we're going to pull in what we've learned as well. Mm. Why don't we close out? Word of prayer. Any questions by now? I think I, have, I might have a minute or two. Any questions on that? And, and by the way, as before you ask, I want to say this. I do not stand before you as an expert. I don't even pretend to stand before you as an expert. I'm a searcher for, for truth. I want to know Jesus better. I want to know how to serve him. I am sharing with you the little I know. I was always curious when he took the blood in into the sanctuary. And it said he sprinkled it seven times with his finger. What was he really sprinkling the blood on? I don't know. We don't know. I was just curious, like, um, is it on the floor? It seems to me, don't take this for gospel, but the logical thing to me would be it was on the floor. Why? 
because we have no record of that curtain being taken out and come in. Yeah, and wash it out on the right. You would have to. Now, now I, I do want to say this, that when the Ark of the Covenant was, was hidden, and we don't know where it is, by the way, we don't need to know. It's irrelevant. The value of the box was the law. And it's in your Bible. Amen. 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 The box is irrelevant, except for what it pointed to, and I suppose it's value of gold. But beyond that, <laughs> Israel, Israel came to view it as some good luck charm, and, and it became an idol. Right, yes. it is. The, the point was what was in it. All that, all that box, it was just a box for the Ten Commandments. Um, once that was lost, then when you get to uh, Herod's temple, or the temple that was built after the Babylonian captivity, that room's empty. Wow. It was empty. And in the Mishnah, which is the Jewish book of traditions, not inspired, but they say it was placed on the curtain, and then they would replace the curtain once a year. Hmm. But you can do that if his presence isn't in the most holy, because if it is, you better not remove that curtain. You better not be in there. Yeah. You see that's what I'm true. saying? Yeah, that's a very valid point. So it seems to me Real that the blood, it, just by logic, would yeah, have to be sprinkled on the floor. Now, what would happen, interestingly, if you remember, Israel moved in the wilderness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and scholars guesstimate they moved about 50 times. When you're looking at about 3 million people, that's impressive. Yeah, it is. Or 2.5 million. Okay, but every time they left, when people came through the camp, what did they find? On the floor. And what would that do to you? Wouldn't that make you go, Wouldn't it make you curious? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you start asking questions? <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. And so I, 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 this is the thought that goes through my mind. As I when the, uh, the, 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 the day of atonement, when the priest went to the most holy place, um, he had to be, he had to make sure he was rid, basically rid of sins, right? If I'm not mistaken, is it true that they tied a rope on his leg just Mishnah. to not end? Is that what he said? Yeah, yeah they did it, but there was no, there was nothing in there to kill him. In the Mishnah, they did that. But watch this. Uh, if you knew, if you knew that you went in there and you had sinned and you were going to die, how careful are you going to be? Mm -hmm. You already got the story of Nadab and Abihu. No games here. Mm -hmm. What they would do, those priests, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, check this out, would sit down, surrounded by all the priests, their books open, and they were all schooled. He went through the process in his mind, step by step, step by step. No, 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 no. One would say, you forgot this. <laughs> every year, they went through every step. He had a whole team that was preparing him for that day. That brother knew full well. He walked in there, and everything was not right between his soul and his Savior. He was a good And there's no record of that ever happening. No. There's no record of that ever happening. They were very careful. But we do get that from the mission. But by the time the mission was written, there was nothing in there. Mm. There was nothing in there. So that's what happened. No so, others? Oh, yeah. What is, what is the, the Jewish people, and I guess we could go on Google and look it up, but if you know, what is the, the explanation for that? I mean, that's their whole service. You know, there's nothing there in the most holy place. They no longer kill animals, you know, for the sanctuary service. What is their explanation for the, the method of salvation, you know? They, the, the, the Jewish, the, the Israel is more secular than the United States. That's right. Mm -hmm. And when, when, the Isra when the people in Israel hear about us, the Christians here talking about the temple being rebuilt, they think the whole thing's crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a few uh, that are uh, orthodox or, 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 or intense still. And to be quite honest with you, I'm not quite sure of the process unless they are anticipating the rebuilding of the tabernacle. We're looking forward. But anyway, thank you. That's a good question. Let's go down with a word of prayer. That was a signal to me. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for the time you've given to us here as we have looked at the sanctuary through prayer and how each furnishing, Lord, is uh, a trigger to help us to know what to pray for intelligently. And here we're seeing the plan of salvation and how you are working Lord, to destroy sin and yet save the sinner. And you gave your son to be the transferring agent, Father, who, who, who um, willingly, Lord, voluntarily made himself to sacrifice to redeem us, Lord, from the penalty of the broken law, which is death. 
he died our death. And so we are grateful, Lord, for your great love and mercy. I pray that you'll continue to keep me fresh as we prepare for the, our next session, our last one for today, here in this room, that your name will be glorified in it. Thank you. We praise you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.